today in Swift UI, doing some fancy animation Stop. shit. Stop. Let's begin. Let us do the begin. Last time we took a look at text fields, and I'm sure the adrenaline is still coursing through your veins after that, so I thought we would take a look at something a little simpler, which is animations. Delicately placed animations can make potentially boring tasks, such as studying one's flashcards, into something slightly more interesting. Here I needed to represent progress through a study session, and so I thought I could take the opportunity to give the app some personality by designing some animations. While it seems that SwiftUI animations are more thoroughly covered in tutorials out there, they seem to focus on simpler examples, and I hope I have some useful advice to offer from my experiences building slightly complicated animations like this one. I think one of the morals of this story, which is also one of that of the text field videos, is that sometimes the hard way ends up being easier. With a declarative UI framework like this, the challenge isn't in actually implementing the animations. The Swift UI runtime handles this for you. The challenge is instead to represent a data structure wherein one can easily extract the animatable properties. So the first step is to actually know what you want to achieve so that you can design a data structure or use existing data structures that will not be actively resisting your attempts to animate them. So here, let's just take a look at what we have. There is certainly an H stack nest to this animation. There are two distinct groupings of cards, those which are currently being studied, and then a complete pile that collects off to the right. The currently studied card is brighter and elevated compared to those in the queue, and it should animate smoothly between the two stacks. When it's complete, it should fly over to the completed pile. One other important detail to notice is that the cards at the rightmost side of the queue stack up beyond a certain limit. This is one of the reasons that an H-stack is untenable. We could probably be clever with offsets and get this behavior somehow out of an H-stack, but it's not really that difficult, as we'll see, to write this by hand. All we're going to need to do is some very basic math, not even much geometry, just some addition and multiplication. It's nothing very frightening at all. Let's imagine a data structure for this card list. Let's think about what pieces of information we want easy access to in order to render this to the screen. We clearly need what cards we're studying. These cards need to have some kind of identity so we can order them, and they also have a rank, which is represented by these Roman numerals and plus signs. We'll also need to track a position of a currently selected card, such that it can be focused on the left-hand side. We'll also need every other card's position relative to the focused card, such that they can be offset appropriately. Also, once they've been successfully studied, we're going to need to remove them from this queue, maintaining the order otherwise, and then taking that card and adding it to some other data structure, which will represent completed cards. So we can design a data structure where we can easily pop out the current card and have the next card just simply move over. Given all of this information, the ordering of the cards, which are currently being studied, which are in a completed pile, and the ability to easily cycle through the cards, know which one is selected, and know every card's order relative to the currently selected cards, we should be able to, given that information, generate a list of properties that each card needs to have. And really, this shouldn't be very complicated. It should be maybe a 15-line function. And then we can simply plug these properties into a view, and SwiftUI will do the rest. So thank you for sticking with me through this preamble. We will review it as we actually get into the code. So let's do that now. The first thing we're going to need is a card view. So let's make a new Swift UI view. I always like to set the preferred color scheme to dark so my eyes don't burn. And now we can replace this text just with a color. Let's just make it white and let's give it a frame with the particular width and height. Let's start with 45 and we can delete the alignment. Let me zoom in here. Some rounding would be nice, so let's add a corner radius. It looks all right. And instead of implementing Roman numerals, let's just go with Arabic numerals and throw on an overlay here with some text. We'll just start with the number one. And obviously we can't see that, so let's give it a foreground color of black. And let's make this a little nicer by adding a custom font. That's a little small, and that looks all right. Of course, instead of just hard coding the rank to the number one, we want to accept this as an input. So let's accept an input property called rank, and then we can use that in here. Now we'll need to pass in the rank where we call this. And there we go. We also want to animate this number when the rank changes. We want the old number to slide out the bottom and the new one to come in through the top. In order to test drive this animation, we could make this rank a state variable and then add some kind of on tap trigger and increment that so we could see the animations but this would involve mucking up the card view in a way that we're just going to have to roll back, as this is the interface we want. And unfortunately, preview providers can't have state variables on them. That doesn't work. 
And so what I like to do instead is make a new view. We can call it preview and store it in our preview provider. And the whole purpose of this is to hold onto the state that neither our preview provider nor the view that we're wrapping here, card view, is fit to hold. So here we can add our state variable rank, give it the value of one to start with. And all we do in the body is just call our card view passing in that rank. But now we can add that on tap gesture. And inside it, we can set rank equal to some random integer between one and 10. And now we can safely mess with our animation code. The last thing to do is just to replace this card view with our new preview struct. Let's actually run this preview now. And now tapping on the card changes its number randomly. So let's start screwing with the animation. Let's break the text out onto another line. And let's add a transition property. We want to use any transitions asymmetric constructor because we want it to come in from the top and exit out the bottom. Our insertion transition can be move from the top edge and our removal transition can be move to the bottom edge. And then we'll also combine this with an opacity transition. This can be a little awkward to read, so let's break it out into its own property. There we go. Let's preview it again. Nothing happens. So why is this the case? Why is nothing happening? This is because SwiftUI only triggers a transition if the underlying view changes, not just its contents, but the actual view. SwiftUI is basically being very clever here and internally keeping track of the identity of this view. If you read the code we wrote, we're not actually saying that we want to replace this view. We only want to replace the text that is contained inside of the view. So it's actually doing what we asked for. It would be pretty weird if every time text content changed, SwiftUI would attempt to totally transition the view. So the question is, what do we want to do in this case when we actually want SwiftUI to treat this as an entirely new view for each number? It turns out that we can override SwiftUI's automatic identity tracking for views by using the ID modifier. In here, we can use any hashable value, and that will be set as the identifier for the view. Anytime that changes, SwiftUI will treat the entire sub-hierarchy as a different view. So we can just make this equal to the rank, because that's when we want to transition between cards. It's also important to actually have the ID modifier after transition, because we want to use this transition when we replace this view. And lastly, we need to add an animation modifier. And now let's see what this looks like. Perfection. Perfection. And now it's time for the main event, which is the card grid. But first, let's pull out the size as a CG float. Let's set it to 35 instead of 45 and add that in here so we can make this configurable. Lovely, so let's build a new view. We'll call it card grid view. And of course, let's first quickly turn out the lights. Much better. As a first step, let's just get something on the screen. I'm thinking we can start with a horizontal row of cards along the top. Let's actually just first start with an H stack and then we can change it from there. So let's go here, delete this, make an H stack. And if we want multiple cards in here, we're going to have to have a for each view. For now, let's just use a range of integers and we'll use our card view in here. Beautiful. Perfection. Of course, I said we didn't want to use an H stack. So let's quickly make our own version. I'll keep the existing H stack here as reference. I'll copy this, format it, but now I'll change this H to a Z. So clearly this isn't right. All our cards are just stacked on top of one another, the last one on top. So we're going to have to handle the offset ourselves. Luckily for us, an H stack is not very difficult to implement. All we need to do is add an offset and set the X equal to the index times the width of the card, which was 35 plus some spacing, which we can just set as eight for now. And this expects a CG float, so we can have this fix it for us. And here we go, it almost looks right. The only problem is that it starts from the center. And that's because the Z stack, I believe, uses the size of its largest child as its size. So when it's centered by the containing V stack, it's only using the size of a card, which is 35 by 35 to determine its central alignment. We could fix this by adding an explicit width to our Z stack, but we don't actually even need to worry about this because we're not trying to align it with an H stack. And then we can smash our custom H stack over to the left side by first adding a frame modifier with a max width of infinity, which if you look over to the right, will grow its blue boundary box to fill up the entire screen. A size of infinity will tell SwiftUI to provide the view all of the space it can possibly offer it. And then to get it over on the left side, we can add an alignment of leading. And there we go. There are a few places we could go next, but let's start by replacing this hard-coded range with some real cards, and then we'll add the ability to cycle through those cards. So the next thing we need to do is actually represent a card somehow. So let's make a new struct and call it card. We want this to be identifiable so we can use it in a for each easily. And in order to conform to the identifiable protocol, we need to give it an ID, which we can just start out as a UUID. And then of course a card needs a rank, so we'll just start this at one. And this will do for now for a representation of a card. We'll add a state property to our card grid view. We'll start it off with something simple, just an array of cards. 
I'll just instantiate a few in here so we have something to work with. And now we can replace our range with these cards and use the rank of the card instead of the index. Of course, we still need the card's index in the array in order to calculate the offset. And here we must do a slightly uncomfortable jig for SwiftUI's pleasure. If we want the index, we'll have to call enumerated. However, this gets us back an enumerated sequence and not an array. So SwiftUI will tell us that it cannot convert this, but we can wrap this enumerated sequence with the array constructor and that will turn it back into an array. But now we have an array of this tuple of an offset and an element, which is no longer identifiable. So we can use this overloaded constructor that allows us to specify a key path to the identity, which will be the elements ID. And now we're going to have to add index before card. And now everything compiles. And there are our new cards. In order to make this slightly more realistic, let's change this to be a random integer. Lovely. Let me just shift this over so we have some more room for code. I do find this dance here with the enumerated sequence to be slightly frustrating. So whenever you want to get the index of an element inside of a for each view, you basically have to repeat this and it's kind of silly. So perhaps we can do something a little more interesting here. Let's go back to this version and we could take a look at the problems. There are two of them. One is that enumerated sequence does not conform to random access collection, whereas array does, and that's why we had to wrap it. And the second issue is that the element of this, which is just a tuple, a named tuple in this case, cannot conform to identifiable. So one way of dealing with this would be to add another method, an extension method to arrays, wherever the element is identifiable. We can call that function with index or something, and we can make that return an array. Basically call enumerated and then wrap it in that array constructor just as before. And then to deal with a second issue, instead of just using a named tuple like this, we can make a struct that has the same shape as this tuple. However, we can make it conform to identifiable. That might sound somewhat complicated, but I think it'll be easier to just see in code. Let's start out with that struct. Let's just call it something generic like element with index. And this will be parameterized by some element type that is identifiable. And this will have two properties, the index, which will be an integer, as well as the element itself, which will be that generic element type. And now we can make this struct itself conform to identifiable just by delegating the protocol's ID parameter to return its elements ID type. So that does it for the struct. Now let's add an extension method onto array. And we only want this to exist where the element conforms to the identifiable protocol. We can make a function called with indices. And this will return an array of element with index where the type element is the same as the array. And in order to implement this, we could basically do what we were doing before. First call enumerated, then we can map over this, and we can now return from here an element with index using the index and the element from the enumerated sequence. And that actually seems to work because map returns an array. We no longer need to wrap the enumerated sequence in the array constructor. So now let's replace enumerated up here with with indices. And unfortunately, now we can no longer pattern match on this. So we can just remove that altogether and use $0.element for the card and $0.index for the index. And if I build this, everything compiles. So that's one way of doing this. The downside, of course, is that we lose the destructuring syntax, which can be nice. So if we want to do that, we can actually make a new view called something like for each with index. This will also need to be parameterized by some element that has to be identifiable. And this will be a view. Now let's pick out some arguments. First, we need the elements. So this will be an array of element. And then we'll need that second argument, which is a closure. So we'll accept a content function. And this will be a function from an index and an element to some view, which we'll also have to introduce as a type parameter. And this will also have to be a view. It's getting a little wordy in there, but this is the way you have to do it. Now we can add a body. And in here, we can delegate to the original for each using our elements, calling enumerated on it, wrapping it in an array, using the key path that we did before as its ID. And then as the closure, we can call our content function, passing in the offset and the element. And to get this to work up here, we now have to use for each with index, delete with indices, and go back to accepting the index and the card as arguments that will be destructured correctly. And of course, now we need a label, but everything compiles again. I know that was a bit of a tangent, but it's important to realize that there are ways to escape from the awkward position Swift UI occasionally puts you in. If you find yourself dissatisfied with the API of an existing view, you can always wrap it and give yourself a better API. When working in your own code bases, especially on larger ones that you're going to live in for a while, it's nice to be able to build the world you want to live in. Add extension methods to the built-in classes. Go crazy. Write your own wrapper views. Clean up the place. 
make a happy home for yourself and your code. Here were a couple of different ways of making an API slightly nicer. In the end, I think I prefer this different view, so I'm gonna delete this code for now. Okay, no more tangents. I'm clearly addicted to tangents. Now we're going to actually get to animating this card queue. To start with, let's just keep things in this card grid view. We'll start breaking things out once this gets a little too bloated, but I think there's still some breathing room here. Let's add a new parameter, which will be the state representing our current index. This is the index of the currently selected card. We can start this at zero. Next, we'll need some way of interacting with this. So for now, let's just add an on tap gesture and increment the current index in here. Next, let's actually use this current index. Instead of just offsetting each card by its index in the array, we want to offset it by its position relative to the current index. So we're going to have to do some very basic math in here. Let's make a let variable in this closure, call it relative index. And we can set this equal to the cards index minus the current index. So if the current index is two representing, well, this card that happens to also have the rank of two, then zero, the index of the first card, minus the current index will be negative two and will be offset two positions to the left. It'll have a negative x offset and be off screen as we want. Let's now use relative index instead of index. And now we have to return this final card view. Of course, things start to get complicated when you do interesting logic inside of a closure inside of a view builder. So a quick and dirty hack around this is to just build a function. We can just call this card view and we'll accept as input our index as well as our card. And we can make this return some view. Now we'll grab this stuff, paste it in here and simply call card view passing along the index and the card. If you have trouble with type inference in view builders, pulling stuff out either into other views, views, or just helper functions like this really seems to help Xcode get a handle on what the hell's going on. So let's reload the preview. It looks the same as before. So let's change the current index to two and rerun this. And now we've lost two cards. We can assume that they're safely tucked behind the screen over here. But in order to make sure that that's actually what's going on, let's set this back to zero and run this view and make sure that animations are enabled. So let's also add an animation of spring. And I'll run this. So now I'll just click on a view. And lo and behold, the current index is incrementing. The new offset positions are being calculated correctly and it's flying off screen. Of course, when we reach the end, it's not wrapping around. We haven't added the circularity, the cyclical nature to this array. We're just adding one to our index. It's getting to be about the point where our view is getting a little complicated. We don't necessarily want to interweave the logic of incrementing this queue correctly with the layout code. It'll make this view very complicated, mixing up a whole bunch of concerns. Before things get crazy, let's pull out this idea of a queue that wraps around itself. Let's make a data structure that will suit our needs, as I alluded to at the rant at the beginning of this video. At the top of this file, let's make a new data type. We'll give it a fancy name, something real algorithmic. We'll call it a ring buffer. And this is going to need to store some type of element. So we'll parameterize on that. We could store an internal representation of these items as just an array of elements. And then we can also store the current index, which will be an integer, and this can start out at zero. So the whole point of this abstraction's existence is to tuck away the hairy details of incrementing this circular index. So we're going to want to have a function on this, something called next, and this will have to be mutating. And it will be the job of next to increment the current index, but then also that this current index loops back to the beginning if it's equal to the current count of items. We can just set this index once again to zero. Now, once we use spring buffer in our card grid view, we can safely call next as much as we like, knowing that it's going to loop back on itself. And to anticipate some future requirements, we also want a mutating function called pop, which will return to us an element. We want this to pop out the element at the current index so we can use remove on array and pass in the current index. And this will return the element removed. But then if that current index was at the end of the list, we wanna make sure that it returns back to zero. And because we're going to use this logic in two functions, let's just pull this out and make a private mutating function called something like normalize index. And this is just going to do that. And now up here in pop, instead of storing this value in some intermediate variable, we can actually use a little cool keyword called defer and call normalize index in here. Defer simply makes sure that this block will get called before we exit the function at the very end. It's not really necessary to use here, but it does save us a line of code and it is fun by certain sick definitions of fun. And now we also need to remember to call normalize index down here and our ring buffer is complete for the time being, and now we can go about using it. So how do we use it? We simply wrap our array in the ring buffer constructor. 
using the array as its items property. And now instead of passing the buffer itself to for each with index, we'll just pull out the items. And then finally down here, instead of calling current index plus equals one, since this is all wrapped up inside of the ring buffer, we'll call cards.next. We can also remove the current index state as that's part of the cards, which means down here we will call cards.currentIndex. And now let's see what happens when we run this. I'm tapping here on the two, we go to the seven, the five, the seven, the two, and on the moment of truth, we wrap around back to the beginning. Our data structure works perfectly. And the nice part about this is that in our tap gesture, we just say, hey, ring buffer, give me the next card. And ring buffer can decide how it wants to do that index normalization thing. And so this leaves our view a little lighter and a little easier to read. We're not mixing up weird index logic. Sprinkling your index tracking logic in between layout concerns is a sure way to get off by one errors and all sorts of weird bugs down the line. By building a nice separated abstract data structure that knows nothing about cards and nothing about SwiftUI, we can test this separately, write our own unit tests, make sure that this works the way we want it to, and then we can use the abstraction wherever. We can turn this into its own library, use it in all of our code bases, using the Swift package manager. It's delightful. It's delightful. It's delightful. Okay. Now I wouldn't be a weird self-loathing code brevity pedant without pointing out that this is quite redundant. We are building an anonymous closure, passing in two arguments to another function. Whenever this is the case, you can delete that intermediate function and just pass along that function directly. So we can just say self.cardView. And this works just the same. So now let's make our animation a little more interesting and let's build the completed card pile. So we're going to add another state variable and call this completed. And this will be a list of cards that are completed. And for now, we can handle the logic of completion in here. We'll replace the cards.next call and we will encode what it means to complete a card. This is why we wrote pop. So we can use this value and on our completed cards, we can call insert. We can insert this element, grabbing this guy at zero. So let's see what this does. When we click on this list, well, now they just disappear. They're fading out instead of going off screen. Ostensibly, these are being added to our completed card list, but we have to render this first. To keep this view body from getting too inscrutable, let's just pull out our card queue into another function here. And now we can use this in here. And this will make it clearer when we wrap this in a Z stack, because we also want to add something very similar to this that's instead going to be called completed view. And we're going to put this at the bottom. And let's get our preview set up so we can see what's going on. I'm going to stop running this. And then I'm going to put a card in this to start with. I can actually just move these parentheses over. Let's put two cards in here. And the first thing we can do is actually make this align at the end. But then we don't want to use this card view logic again because this is made specifically for cards in the left study queue. So we can just make another function that returns a different view. We can call it the completed card view. In here, we don't care about its relative index, so we can delete that. And just to make it a little different, let's have it be offset in the Y axis. And then let's use this down here and then use just the regular index instead. And I forgot to write the word card. And now we're almost there, except I'm using the wrong array of cards. Instead, I want to use the completed cards Okay, that's looking better. Let's run this again and see what happens. When I click on this card, it disappears and another one reappears in the completed card list. So that's almost there, except it doesn't do the delightful animation between these two sides. And in order to accomplish this, we can use a new view modifier that was introduced in iOS 14 called matched geometry effect. This requires an ID property, which will uniquely identify these views so that they can be connected and animated between their new positions. So here we can simply use the card's ID. And then we need something called a namespace. And in order to get this, obviously we just say at namespace, and then we get a namespace. So we can just use that. This is clearly some magical Swift UI implementation detail. It's an opaque value. You just need to make sure that if you want two cards or two views to link up, they need the same namespace. And now we also need to grab this and put it on our completed card view. And now let's see what happens. Okay, I'm gonna click on this card again. And it's beautiful. It works. Just like that. It's magic. So now let's add some more details to our animation now that the broad strokes are in place. Mainly, we want to make sure that the currently selected card is slightly elevated, that all of the non-selected cards are slightly dimmed, and that the cards stack up beyond a certain limit. Let's say beyond the fifth card, we'll have them stack up behind it, getting more and more shadowed as they recede into the black abyss of whatever this represents. Perhaps my time making this video. And then we can make these completed cards green to represent happiness, as well as the envy that other iOS developers will feel after they witness your beautifully designed apps. And we can also make these stack up nicely too, because this is a little ugly right now. 
So let's start with the elevation of the currently selected card. In order to do this, we could just add to our offset here, and we can add a Y offset. Basically, if the relative index is equal to zero, that means that the current index is equal to the index of the current card. And then we can set some Y offset like negative 15, otherwise we can use zero. And I forgot to add a comma. And there it goes, floating above the other cards, proud to be the current card. Let's make sure this still works. So when I click on a card, we'll see that something weird is actually happening. The cards are no longer smoothly moving from one place to the other. There's a bit of a fade in the y-axis. It's vaguely reminiscent of the accidental seams in this video where I make cuts. Subtle, but pretty infuriating and not at all what we want. So how can we fix this? Well, it's one of those subtle cases in SwiftUI where the order of modifiers really counts. Because we're putting the match geometry effect after the offset effect, it's trying to match the geometry of the offset and not the geometry of the underlying card view. So you have to make sure that you put this on the very view you want to match and don't have any sort of intermediate view modifiers mucking up the logic. When running into funky behavior with SwiftUI, it's often a good idea to shuffle around the view modifiers and to slowly build up your mental model for how these things work. But the oddness of that visual glitch actually helps us understand how matched geometry effect is working under the hood. If we replace this card view, let's say with the color blue, and give it a frame of maybe 30 by 30 pixels, and then run this again, we'll see that there's a fade going on here. Let's make this way bigger now, 100 by 100. And in this ugly weirdness, we can see what it's doing, which is not really that special at all. When a view with the match geometry effect is rendered, it consults SwiftUI and looks up the view hierarchy, probably to some manager, or perhaps this namespace is the culprit. And it asks, let's just say this namespace, hey, do you have any other views with my ID? And if it does, the namespace might return to it two properties, the origin, the position of the view that matched it, as well as perhaps an image of it which the current view will then use to start itself at the origin of whatever previous view it matched with, and also render itself as the image of the other view, and then sort of do an inelegant crossfade between the two views. So once you understand how this behaves, you'll realize that it's not actually always the solution you want. But it's going to work, at least in this case, for now. Because both the starting position and the ending position look the same, for the most part, the illusion is going to be a success. If you look extra close, you can see a slight fade in the middle as the two positions animate and crossfade between each other. It's kind of annoying, but it's certainly better than the giant blue box turning into a tiny white square. Next up, we can just make the completed card screen. To do that, it might actually be easiest to dive back into card view, and we can pass along some is complete property. Let's just set that to true here in anticipation, and then make this work by jumping into card view. We will now accept an is complete property, and this can be a Boolean that will start out as false. And then we can replace this base color with the decision. We can abstract this, of course, as always, and we can say color, which we can just make a view to be flexible, as colors are views. If we are complete, we will choose the color green. Otherwise, we will choose the color white. And then we can use this new color property down here, and it compiles. So let's go back to our card grid view. And now the completed cards are this very ugly shade of irradiated green. So if we click on a card, they will animate. And because of that crossfade, it doesn't look Horrible, it looks like it's changing color as it's flying. It's a bit of a hulky green for my taste, but it will work for now. Next, we can tackle the slight dimness of these other views. You might be tempted to throw on an opacity modifier, but keep in mind that we're eventually, in the next step, actually going to make these guys stack up on one another. And if they are slightly opaque, it's going to make them seem translucent and ugly and bad, and we shouldn't do that. We can try for now to use an overlay here. So over this guy, let's throw, say overlay, use color.black, and set the opacity based on whether or not it is the current index. So once again, if relative index is equal to zero, then we can use zero. Otherwise, we can set it to 0 0.2 or something to make all the non-current cards just ever so slightly darker. Now this overlay isn't going to respect the corner radius of the card view, but because it's color black on the black background, that won't really be visible right now. And now when I click through the cards, the current card becomes highlighted again. And now we can move on to the stacking of the cards. So let's just copy this and make this a little longer so that we have some cards to work with. And let's say now that every card after this position, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, index 4, will want to be stacked up behind 5. They'll look progressively darker and it'll be cool. This card view is getting a little noisy right now, and we could do a few things. 
But for the sake of simplicity, let's just make this function body a little longer and pull out some values instead of just continually adding ternary checks in line, because these can get a little obnoxious. For this stacking, we're going to be concerned with the x offset property. So let's pull this out now, and we'll set a variable called x, and we'll use that value that we just had as the initial value. Okay, so this first value is a good default, but then we want to modify it if the card's position is beyond that maximum. So we can start by making a little check here to see if the relative index is greater than 4. And if it is, we can lock it to that fourth position to start with. So let's just take this logic again and set x equal to 4 times 35 plus 8. The cards are still there, but they're all hidden behind this number 7 as they all have the exact same position. So we do want to add some additional value to this x. So we can say x plus equals whatever distance past the maximum each of these cards are. So we can get the relative index and subtract 4 from that. So 5 will be 1. And then we can multiply this times 35, our card width, divided by 3. So a third of a card. And then we can fix the types here. And there we go, they're stacking, but of course it looks horrible for a couple of reasons. Firstly, our overlay. It's now become evident because it's laid up top of another card, but also the order is wrong. And of course, also, also, our code is a total mess because we're using all of these magic numbers everywhere. It's hard to decide which matter is more pressing, but let's arbitrarily fix the views first. We can add a z-index modifier and simply set this to be the negative index. And then we're going to have to turn that into a double. And now cards that are later on in the queue will be rendered behind earlier cards. In order to fix this overlay, we can just throw another corner radius on this. I think the value is 8 before. That seems to have done it. But now it looks like we've got one really long 4, which is somewhat disturbing. And in order to fix this, we're going to also have to change the shadow property here, based on the distance past the limit. But at this point, things are getting quite inscrutable. I find that it's okay to get a little messy as you're figuring stuff out, but before you move on to something else, if you're going to need to ever touch this code again, be sure to make it more legible, because this is going to last in my brain for approximately three minutes before this just dissolves into utter chaos. So let's refactor this a little bit. First, let's just pick some numbers. Random numbers, they're confusing. What do we know about these numbers? What do these numbers mean? Well, 35, this is the card width. So let's make a new variable called card width and set that to 35. And then we can replace each instance of 35 with card width. And also, because now we're setting it as a variable, it's no longer being implicitly cast to a CG float, so we'll have to type that explicitly up here. And that's now screwing up this addition. So we'll just move the parenthesis over here and delete this. The next magic number to tackle is 8, and this is equal to the spacing we want in between our cards. So we'll say spacing. This can also be a CG float, and we'll set that to 8. And now we'll replace all instances of 8 with spacing, where it makes sense. And I've written the word scasing, which is not a thing, so I'll change that. And it looks like we have another type issue here. I think moving the parenthesis over here will fix it. And it did, and now we have some unnecessary double parenting going on. That's an urban legend that that helps. The next number is 4. This is a slightly weirder one. This is kind of the max x index that we care about, and we're just going to set that to 4. Max x index, max x index, max x index, and of course there are some more type issues. And now that we have somewhat meaningful names, there is some hope for us interpreting this again if we come back to it in the future. But there are some other concepts beyond just magic numbers. For instance, there's some meaning behind this. Relative index minus the max x index. What does this mean? So this seems to represent our distance past the max x index. So we can call this property, I don't know, the x overflow or something. We just need a name for it. So we can put this up here and say x overflow down here. I don't really know of a great name for width plus spacing, spit, wasting, none of those sound good. So I'm okay with just keeping it as it is. This is sufficiently understandable as a concept. We can use our x overflow here once again to just say that instead of relative index being greater than the max x index, we can say if x overflow is greater than zero, then we can do this. And now that we have x overflow as its own property, we can use it in the calculation of this shadow, which we can also separate out into its own property. So we can create a variable called shadow, set it equal to this calculation, use shadow in here, and then we can modify shadow. We can add to it x overflow times, let's say, 0.2, and we have to fix this type again. Okay, that was a bit of work, but now it looks good, at least, and that's what counts. And it animates and they move between the positions correctly. To make it ever so slightly sexier, let's also add an actual shadowy shadow to these. Let's use five or something. And that's really subtle, but if you look closely, it adds a little more 
a je ne sais quoi. So this function is getting a little ugly, but luckily we're also coming to the end in terms of complexity here. We have a few options for managing this complexity going forward. The first thing to do, obviously, is just to pull out variables and name things. Make things more explicit, name anything that's a number, identify other important combinations of those scalar values, like x overflow, and then just generally try to group things up together. So we're first calculating the x for each of these cards, and then we're calculating the shadow. It is not the most beautiful code in the world, but it is workable. One other latent concept is this check of relative index being equal to zero. We're using that twice, both here and in the shadow calculation. And what this really means is whether or not this is the current card. So we can also is current card. And we can set this up right at the beginning, is current card equal to that. The next step in terms of cleanup would be to abstract this whole function and elevate it to its own view. Then we can take these little groupings of logic and turn them into computed variables. We have to pack it all into this single function here because it would get a little weird if we abstracted these bits of logic into the card grid view function. We'd have all of these extra private functions that concern just this card view. Due to the fact that this is taking up nearly an entire screen, albeit with giant screen casting sized font, let's do that. So I'm going to delete this. I'm going to make a new struct called positioned card view. We'll make this a view. It will have a body and we will throw this in here for now and see what explodes. We're going to delete the function definition and it looks like it can't find cards.currentindex or a card or a namespace. So let's accept a few things. Let's take in a card. Let's take in this whole relative index property and force our parent to handle this calculation so that we don't have to. Now down here we'll have to use relative index but it'll have the same effect as before. And we'll also need to ask for a namespace. When you accept a namespace as a property, it's actually not just a namespace, it's a namespace.id that will get you, so remember that. And now we can start pulling out some of these intermediary properties into computed variables. So we can say x, which is I believe a CG float, is going to be the result of this calculation. And then we can do the same thing with shadow, which I believe is a double. Next we can pull out these constants, and we can make them all private. And we should also abstract this x overflow, which I think is an integer. And finally, we have to pull out is current card. And this has to be a Boolean. And now let's quickly shift this over to instead of using self.cardView, we're going to have to once again switch to the trailing closure syntax because we also need to pass in the namespace. So let's render a positioned card view, passing in card, relative index, which is going to be cards dot current index subtracted from the current index and then the namespace will be that same namespace. Rendering this, it all works the same. It all works the same. Okay, so what has changed? Card grid view gets a lot lighter. All of this logic has been abstracted into the position card view. We get to separate out the individual calculations into their own isolated variables, which may or may not make this easier to read for you. I think past a certain threshold of complexity, it does make things easier to read. You can more easily comment these things with doc strings. You can see exactly what's relevant to a particular calculation, but it also has grown off of our large texted screen just by a little bit. So that is pretty interesting. And now because it's bugging me, let's also clean up the completed card view. We can also offset these by a third of a card instead of a whole card plus the spacing. Then we can also change the z index to be equal to the negative index. I won't forget to wrap that in a double this time. And then we'll want to add a shadow, which for now we can just grab from here. We'll put it before the offset, and we'll calculate it by multiplying the index times 0.3 and turning that into a double. And now this looks a little less horrible. We should also add that slight corner radius of 8. And if we do this, things explode because once again, I forgot to put this behind the match geometry effect. Let this be a lesson to you all. That looks better. So now let's test the whole thing at once. Let's grab this complete gesture and put this on the completed view. And then on the card queue, we can call cards.next. And now running this, we should be able to move from one card to the other and then complete them. And when we get to the end, we'll loop around to the start. And if we complete a card at the end, we should also loop around to the start. Wow. Wow. Okay. So this isn't everything that there is to animations, but I think it walks through my process and thinking about them. And this time I will say sincerely without the effects um, that you can like and subscribe if you enjoy this. It is greatly appreciated.
I really do like making this stuff, but it takes an obscene amount of time. I think I've spent approximately 15 hours on this video, which sounds crazy. That's probably because I am slightly obsessive. I make a lot of very small cuts to keep it tight, so these are like approximately 3,000 to 5,000 cuts, I have no idea. But anyhow, that's not to say woe is me, it's really fun. I just want people to watch them and enjoy them and learn from them. If you would like to support me in making more of these videos, please well, comment, like, subscribe, etc. As I've already said, I also have a little flashcard app called Omen. You could find it at omen.cards. It's free. Check it out. It might be fun. Tell your friends. And also, if I feel like being especially shameless, I might make myself a Patreon and throw it in the comments. But if these videos really help you and resonate with you, and you'd like to make some other requests, I would love to hear them. Okay, so that does it with the shameless self-promotion, but I did promise myself if I was going to spend 15 hours making a video, I would be slightly more shameless than I am comfortable with. But we have made it through that process now, and I hope this was helpful. Please let me know if you have any other questions. I will put this code base on GitHub as well as another one that I wrote when testing this, where I did not use the match geometry effect, and that technique can actually be even more flexible just because of the limitations that we discussed with match geometry effect. That is it. Signing off. Sayonara.